Well, today is the fifth Sunday of the season of Lent. Uh, back when I first started working on this particular sermon, um, I had no idea what was ahead of us. Um, I had no idea when I picked this particular passage to preach from uh, that I would be preaching to an empty sanctuary, uh, pretty much. Um, that this was what was going on. In fact, when I wrote most of this sermon, um, I had no idea that we would be facing the things that we're facing. It just goes to show you as you start to step into this a little bit more and as we start to work through uh, this passage of scripture that we're gonna be, doing, we're gonna be working on today, it just goes to show you how, how much uh, a, a God has incredible foresight <laughs> to where we're gonna be and what we need to hear in particular moments. Um, so this is the fifth Sunday of Lent. Lent is uh, a season of preparation where we symbolically follow Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days, as Jesus did before he began his ministry. Uh, he went into the wilderness and was tested. He was tempted uh, and then came out of that experience ready uh, for his ministry, ready to then eventually journey on to Jerusalem on Holy Week and then ultimately to the cross and the empty tomb. And so that's our journey. We're almost there. It's hard to believe, but Holy Week is next week. We're going to have Palm Sunday next Sunday. Um, and then we'll have Monday Thursday. I, I believe we're going to be doing a live broadcast of our, our Monday Thursday service as well in some fashion. Um, and that's Holy Week. And then Easter. Woo! But I know. I'm, I'm ready for some Easter, okay? I don't know about y'all, but here's the thing. Uh, we might be celebrating Easter in here on Easter Sunday with just one service, and there might be just a few people in here uh, ready to do worship and lead worship on Easter Sunday. But when this is all over with, I've said this before, the first Sunday back when we're all able to be back here together, that's going to be Easter right then. That's when we're going to celebrate. So y'all need to show up on that day uh, and make sure that you're here. Um, but we're not there yet. We still have some Lent to go through. And Lent is a time when we give some things up, perhaps, or we take up things, we add things to our life. I'm sure that, as I said last week, most of us didn't think or dream that we would give up so much for Lent. <laughs> right? <laughs> but we've also added some things. Some of the things haven't been great. Uh, you know, we've added, uh, you know, the continual search for toilet paper, uh, which I was triumphant yesterday. I got, I got to the Walgreens before the last two packets were gone and managed to return triumphant to my home, holding aloft the toilet paper I had procured. It was, it was an amazing moment. It was getting, it was getting dire in the house. <laughs> Um, but we've also added some other things that might not be so great, uh, like, you know, binging on Netflix, uh, watching shows like Tiger King, uh, like the rest of the world, apparently. Um, so we've, we've added some things that might not be so great, but here's the thing. Maybe we've given up some stuff that, that this time, you know, we had to give up some things that actually matter, Right? We've given up things that actually matter to us, and we're realizing now how much they matter. Um, and maybe you've added some things to your, your Lenten experience. Uh, maybe you've added some stuff that now you're thinking, maybe I want to keep doing this. I want to keep living this way. So I'm hoping that this Lent, which is probably the most memorable Lent that any of us will ever have, I hope that this will be a holy Lent for you. But it's almost to an end. And uh, this is the last sort of sermon that we're preaching in the Lenten series before we head to Holy Week. And the passage of scripture that we're going to be focused on today comes to us from the, the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel had a vision of a valley of dry bones. You know, as I was thinking about this sermon and thinking about how to teach it, I mean, I, I became fascinated with the idea of bones. Um, and what do we learn from bones? What can bones teach us? Uh, and so if you're familiar with any of those television shows like Forensic Files, Cold Case Files, whatever files, all those shows that you watch, um, you know, that some of y'all watch. I don't, I don't watch them all that often, but when I do, invariably, this is what happens, right? Uh, somebody will get caught, some murderer will get busted because... Uh, of bones, right? Bone fragments or something they were able to tell from a skeleton. There are incredible forensic anthropo anthropologists who are able to take a skull 
uh, of a person that's long dead, like this one, for example, uh, of, of a skull of a person who's long dead and be able to recreate what they would have looked like. This is a 9,000-year-old skull. This is a teenage girl of about 16 to 18 years old who died 9,000 years ago somewhere in Greece. And they were able to reconstruct what she looks like, and this is what she looks like. They named her Dawn uh, because she was sort of at the dawn of civilization. Bones can tell us a lot of things, but bones also uh, speak to us of our own mortality. They speak to us uh, about what it means to be frail, to be human, to, to only be here for a while. One of the most incredible literary moments uh, in all of literary history occurs in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, Hamlet is in a graveyard uh, and he picks up a skull in the graveyard of someone that he knew. He's told by the gravedigger that this is Yorick, this was the king's fool, um, the, the, you know, sort of the court jester that Hamlet knew when he was a boy, and he remembers him, and so he holds the skull up and he says, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his shoulders a thousand times, but now how abhorred it is to my imagination. So Hamlet speaks of frailty, of death in the graveyard. That was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> Quoting Shakespeare, come on. Uh, but the desolation that we see, this is a, an image of, of, of a graveyard, so to speak, of whales, of whale bones. And bones speak to us of desolation. They speak to us of mortality. They speak to us of death. Because when there's nothing but bones, all hope is lost. It's all gone. Nothing comes back, right? And so it reminds us of our own mortality. It reminds us of the mortality of those who are around us, our loved ones, our friends. But it also reminds us sometimes bones can give us uh, a, a feeling, right? That, that idea of bones, of destruction, of dust, um, of things that are beyond hope. I mean, there are many of us that we've left for dead relationships. We've left for dead uh, our aspirations, our hopes and dreams, and even our faith can sometimes be left for dead. It reminds us uh, that there's a hopelessness, right? There's something that's never coming back. But those of us who are Christians, we're called to hold on to a defiant hope, a hope that exists in spite of the circumstances. And right now, there's a lot of us, I think, that are struggling right now to have hope. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of trapped. There's this, this specter, this fear of this invisible enemy that's out there that can affect all of us and, and may affect some of us in ways that are absolutely deadly. And so we live in this fear and this dread, and it seems sometimes like there's no end in sight. It seems like it's kind of hopeless, and we feel helpless, and, and this is where we live and breathe right now. But see, for those of us who are Christians, we hold on to this defiant hope, a hope that exists inside of us, because we say, at least, that we believe in a God who doesn't leave things for dead, that this God raises what was left for dead into new life. We say that we believe this, but now is the time for us to have that defiant hope and to hold on to it, because the one thing that I want us to know, the big idea from today's sermon that I want you to internalize and to hang on to is simply this. God is still in the resurrection business. God is still in the resurrection business. So as we go to our passage in Ezekiel, we're going to be taking a look at Ezekiel chapter 37. Um, and uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about Ezekiel. Uh, I don't have my usual Starbucks tea because the only Starbucks that was doing, uh, you know, we could go pick it up was like seven miles away which was just terrible. I know y'all feel sorry for me, don't you? <laughs> Suffering for the cause of Christ with my own tea. 
<laughs> so Ezekiel um, is an interesting character. So he's in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, he's a prophet, um, but he wasn't always a prophet. Ezekiel was supposed to be a priest. That was his life's ambition. That's what he was training for. That's what he was supposed to do. That was the aspiration, right? Um, but uh, in the late 6th century BCE, the Babylonians came into the region and took over the kingdom of Judah, which is where Jerusalem was uh, and where Ezekiel lived. And so Ezekiel was part of the first wave of captives that were taken back to Babylon. Uh, for Some of you might remember the stories of Daniel and his friends uh, who were part of that first wave that were taken to Babylon to be assimilated into Babylonian culture. So Ezekiel experiences this. And so here's what happens with Ezekiel. His dream ended. Like the lifelong ambition that he had to be a priest, like he'd been training his whole life. Um, that was what he was supposed to do. All of a sudden, it was over. It ended like overnight. He was taken away. But still, he had this desire, this longing, and a hope that existed that one day, one day he might be able to return and to be able to go into the temple and to preside and to be uh, a priest. But then he gets word uh, that the temple has been destroyed, that it is no more. There's a second wave of captives that are brought to Babylon. And so the dream of being in the temple is dashed forever. There is no temple. There is no Jerusalem. All of it is gone. And then his wife dies on top of all of that. So Ezekiel knew a little bit about what it meant to feel dry inside, to feel like the Spirit of God had just left him, that all of his dreams, all of his aspirations, all of his life had just come to an end. It was not able to be resurrected. And then God gives him a vision. And this is where we pick this up in Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus as the Lord God come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. What an amazing vision. From a guy who knew what it felt like to feel as though his bones had dried up that he was experiencing a dryness in his spirit that he had never felt before. And the big question 
the big question that's in the middle of this vision as he looks out on this vast valley that's full of dried bones scattered everywhere. The big question that is asked is, can these bones live? Will these bones live? And the question is not asked by Ezekiel, interestingly enough. It's asked by God to Ezekiel, basically saying, do you believe? Do you believe in the impossible? I mean, this is our question too, isn't it? When we survey the dry bones in our lives, when we survey the barrenness, the things that we feel have been lost and left for dead, this is our question, the question that we would answer, and what does, or that we want answers to, and what does Ezekiel do? What does Ezekiel respond? I mean, he's pretty polite, right? He's just like, well, only you know, right? Does he really believe? I mean, that's the question. Does he really know for sure uh, whether God can raise these bones to new life? But he does what he's asked to do, right? He prophesies to them. He speaks to these bones. And uh, interesting enough, the next slide, the breath, the ruach, right? In Hebrew, the spirit of God breathes life I mean, all of those things come together, right? The bones come together. And some of y'all were probably singing that song in your head, you know, them bones and bones and dry bones, right? That song? No? No one? (laughs) See, even at home, I know you're not laughing at my jokes. So... (laughs) <laughs> so so that, that, that song, right, speaks to that moment when all the bones start to come together, and then there's sinew, and then there's, there's flesh, and then they're standing there lifeless still, right? It isn't until the breath, the Spirit of God is, is breathed into them, the breath of life. It's like in the, in the book of Genesis where it says that God breathed into humankind the breath of life and man became, or humankind became, a living soul, the breath, the ruach, the spirit that is within us. That's what enlivens us. That's what gives us the power to believe in the impossible made possible. So what is it that we take away from this passage of scripture? What is the main kind of idea It's simply this, no matter how bleak this situation, nothing, nothing can keep God's resurrecting spirit from breathing life into God's people. So let me ask you that same question that was asked of Ezekiel. Can these bones live? Can these bones live? So what has been left for dead in your life? What have you left for dead? Now, this whole thing that happened where all of a sudden you're mashed together in your house with your spouse and your kids and your relatives and whatever, whoever else happened to be there when everything like shut down and then all of a sudden all of you are trapped together. Uh, Like all of that happened, right? Uh, I mean, You know, you might put a pause in your life for a moment of all the things that were going on before that, but let me tell you something. Whatever was happening, whatever was was going on that was drying you up inside, whatever you had left for dead before all of this junk has happened, it's still going to be there when this is over unless you address it unless you start to take steps. And maybe what you left for dead was relationships. Maybe what you left for dead was your own potential the potential within you to do something amazing or to do something for, uh, for God, uh, to step out in faith, uh, to, to do whatever it is that you were called to do. Maybe what you left for dead was your hope. Or maybe it was your faith. And maybe even now, as some of you are struggling through this crisis, you are starting to feel your own hope fade away. You're starting to see some valleys of dry bones in your life. You're starting to come face to face with maybe the fact that your spirituality was a mile wide but only an inch deep, and now that crisis has happened, that's been illuminated as well. So what have you left for dead? See, here's what I want you to know. If you've left something for dead, I guarantee you God hasn't. Because this is true. God is still in the resurrection business. God is still in the resurrection business. 
So maybe as you look around right now, you're also wondering, like, what is barren and lost around me? You know, in a bigger sense of things, right? So when I was writing this sermon before all of this, I was thinking of the way that we were divided as a country, how we had lost civility, that civility was a valley of dry bones, um, that, that the way that we were struggling through this election year was a valley of dry bones. But all of a sudden, it's like, like here was what I was thinking, and then this virus was basically like, hold my beer, you know? Um, I'm, <laughs> you thought all that stuff was bad, just you wait, right? Because now we've got that going on. There's disasters as well. I just was reading that there was a bunch of tornadoes that have torn through uh, towns on top of everything else. And when we look back over this year with the Australian fires and half of Australia was on fire, I mean, all of the things that we've experienced this year, there's a lot that is lost and barren. But here's what we know. And I want you to hold on to this. And no matter what is seeming lost and barren, it's not lost and barren to God because God is still in the resurrection business. I wanted to share this, these images with you of a very interesting church chapel from the Czech Republic. Uh, it's, a, it's called the Sedlak Ossuary. Now, uh, hopefully, maybe you can, guys can put it on full screen uh, in the broadcast um, as I talk through this, but this is a chapel where people go to worship. Um, and so it's made entirely of bones. And so if you look at the next slide, you can kind of see um, there's the altar. So it's got all of this stuff, and there's other photos. If you go online and you look for Sedlak Ossuary, you can see there's chandeliers made out of bones. There's, everything is made out of bones in the entire chapel. How would you like to worship in that joint? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> so, I mean, wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be pretty daunting to walk in there and to worship? But, you know, the interesting thing is that mass is said in there every day. People walk in there every day to receive Christ, to hear Christ proclaimed that in that chapel that's full of all of those dry bones surrounded by the images of death, the things that are lost, the things that can't be found again, the things that can't be raised, right? That in that chapel, there are people every single day proclaiming the risen Christ and proclaiming the fact that God doesn't let death get the last word. In fact, God doesn't let death get in the way of giving God what God wants. And so as we gather virtually, I want you to remember that. I want you to hold that in your heart, that no matter what's going on around you, no matter what's happening in your own life, no matter what you might feel has been lost and there's no hope and it can't be raised, that you can hold on to this defiant hope that God is still in the resurrection business. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are grateful for this opportunity to gather as your church. Your church scattered uh, all over uh, this wonderful city of ours, all over the country, for all those who are tuning in today from everywhere. God, we are grateful for every single one of them. And God, as we gather, we are reminded that the church is more than a building. The church is more than a place that you go. The church is who we are. And even though we long to gather, even though now that it is prohibited from us, uh, for us to gather, we long for that. We long for the connection but we also know that we are connected by a great cloud of witnesses, by the mysterious uh, way that your spirit works and connects all of us, that we are still part of this family of faith. And God, for those who feel disconnected, for those who feel lost, for those who feel as though there are things that are beyond resurrection in their lives, give them peace, give them courage, and give them defiant hope. We pray all of this in the name of the one who loved us and who gave us these words to pray.
when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.